with powerful commentary on the most important stories of the day, Jamel Bowie has established himself as a rising voice at the nexus of national politics, public policy, elections, and race. Bowie adeptly draws from historical periods as well as current events, from the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and the expansion of civil rights to Black Lives Matter movement to uh, deliver thought-provoking insight on and raise critical questions about the issues at the forefront of national discussion. As the chief political correspondent for Slate Magazine, Bowie covers public policy and race. Recognized for his reporting from the front lines of the Ferguson protests following the fatal shooting of Michael Brown in 2014, Bowie's writing on the unrest and racial issues earned him a spot on Forbes 2015 30 Under 30 in Media List as one of the individuals defining and driving the ever-shifting world of news and content. Bowie is a frequent media commentator and a regular contributor to the weekly roundtable discussion on CBS News' Face the Nation, which draws more than three million viewers each week. There's a lot more to say about Mr. Bowie, but let us now hear it from him, ladies and gentlemen, Jamel Bowie. Hello. <laughs> I am very pleased to be here. This is my first time in Grand Rapids. Uh, it's a very lovely town. I haven't really had a chance to walk around, but I think tomorrow I'm going to uh, take a run, see the, see, the, see the town, see what everything looks like, and maybe uh, take it in. Uh, thank you to Grand Rapids Community College for inviting me to speak. Um, Thank you to all of you for coming out. Uh, I'm going to real quickly take some water to avoid a Marco Rubio moment, which I have on occasion. So I'm a political analyst. <clears throat> uh, I've been doing that for about six years. And in the last two years, I've sort of juggled basically two beats. Uh, the first is elections and politicians in Washington and everything you know, we're experiencing right now in terms of national politics. The other thing is this emerging movement, um, concern over police shootings, over civil rights, Black Lives Matter. Um, I went to Ferguson, I went to Baltimore. Uh, it's still very much on my radar. So these are my two sort of areas of coverage, areas of expertise. And uh, when I was thinking about what I was going to talk about this evening, I figured, you know, these are the two things I focus on most of the time. Let me try to synthesize them into a single, uh, a single narrative, a single look at what's happening in the United States in 2016. So that's, that's what I have. The title of this presentation uh, is called uh, The Civil Rights Movement Today, A Second Redemption. Um, redemption is a particular word, so it's going to need some unpacking. But before we get to that unpacking, I do want to uh, set the mood for the evening a little bit with a quote. It's a quote from James Baldwin, a uh, famed chronicler of the civil rights movement uh, of the 1960s, a uh, famed writer about race and race relations in the United States. I think I read this quote when I was in college, uh, and I've kept carried it with me for a long time. It informs my writing, it informs my perspective on politics, uh, it informs this talk. So here's Baldwin writing in 1965. History, as no one seems to know, is not merely something to be read, and it does not refer merely or even principally to the past. On the contrary, the great force of history comes from the fact that we carry it within us, that we are unconsciously controlled by it in many ways, and that history is literally present in all that we do. It could scarcely be otherwise, since it is to history that we owe our frames of reference, our identities, and our aspirations. All right, keep that in your head, framing device. So Americans as a people, believe very deeply in the idea of progress, economic progress, uh, social progress, racial progress. It's 
of all of our collective beliefs, perhaps the most abiding one. Uh, for, our, for our president, Barack Obama, uh, it is one of the defining features of his rhetoric. I just, you know, last week, the new museum in DC, the National Museum of African American History opened up and President Obama gave the convocation speech for the museum and this rhetoric of progress, this idea that the arc of the universe bends towards justice was very present in the president's rhetoric. Um, that we're always on the path to a more perfect union. I think that for as much as that's a, a belief that I think connects all Americans, it's a belief that we need to complicate a little bit because it's not necessarily true. Progress uh, doesn't always happen. And there are times in our history, times in our society, when the darkest forces end up gaining the upper hand and they keep it, they don't relinquish it. Not a historian, I studied philosophy in college, not very useful, um, but I am preoccupied with history, it's something I very much care about. And so when I think about these times in American history when, to be, be sort of glib about it, the bad guys won, my mind goes immediately to the end of Reconstruction in the late 19th century. Reconstruction, as I'm sure all of you know, uh, comes just after the Civil War. And it's the period when newly free blacks, southern whites, uh, interested northerners, and the federal government all dealt with the devastation of the war. Reconstruction brought a flowering of black political activity. Um, it's, if you were to plot black office holders on a chart, you would see a massive spike between 1866 and you know, 1875, then a precipitous decline. And that precipitous decline would maintain until about the 1960s. So it really is kind of the first, and until the 20th century, the only period when African Americans are participating in electoral politics in a really big way. Reconstruction has a bad reputation, I think. Um, but the truth of it is that it was a bold experiment in biracial democracy. The, our, our first experiment in biracial democracy, the first time in American history that blacks and whites uh, lived in this country with some sort of nominal equality between the two. It was a time of tremendous hardship, but it was also a time of genuine hope and genuine change. Unfortunately, uh, and I'm sure you can see where this story will end up going, Reconstruction governments were under constant assault by the remnants of the Confederacy, for calculant rebels, uh, other antagonistic whites, um, Confederate veterans, unreconstructed, you know, Southern separatist Democrats. The remnants of the old planter aristocracy that still controlled much of the land and much of the power in the reconstructed South. So for more than a decade, from again 1866 with 1876, the South was rocked in this tension. Uh, you had forces for freedom and equality on one hand, people trying desperately hard to build and forge something new out of the, of the ruins of the Civil War. And on the other side, a movement to redeem the South for white supremacy. And that latter movement, backed by bloody terrorism, this is where we see the beginnings of the Ku Klux Klan formed by a former Confederate uh, war leader. This, uh, these redeemers, using a campaign of racial terrorism, drove blacks and their white allies from government, and they eventually reshaped the South's late legal system in the interest of labor control and subordination. And they were aided uh, in a great deal by the indifference of much of the country outside of the South. Moderates beyond the Mason-Dixon line wanted to wipe their hands of all of this. It cost too much money, it required too much effort, and why couldn't the freed slaves just get on without us? And as the radical Republicans who governed the country during the Civil War uh, left office, as President Grant's administration came to an end, uh, the number of allies for the, free, for the freedmen and their families and their, uh, their institutions it dwindled. And so by 1880 or so, um, much of the country outside of the South had simply walked away. They weren't interested in this anymore. So with the help of violence on one hand and indifference on the other hand, the Redeemers won. Uh, once in power, they worked very hard to replicate the conditions of slavery. There is a fantastic book uh, called Slavery by Another Name that details basically what's hap what happens in the interior South 
from around 1885 until the 1940s, and it's forced labor, it's peonage, it is conditions that are almost identical to what existed before the Civil War. Redemption, which is what these people called it, would mean absolute white supremacy. And this would stand for 100 years. Uh, this would be the case up until the 1950s and 60s and 70s. Um, there were brief moments when the Redeemers and their descendants were beaten back. One that kind of stands out to me is in North Carolina in the 1890s. Poor white farmers and poor black farmers ended up controlling the state for four years. Uh, eventually, they were beaten back by terrorism. But more or less, the Redeemers would set the conditions of Southern life up until the Civil Rights Movement. Generations of American citizens uh, would live in fear of lynchings, of racial pogroms. Um, they would be confined to peonage and to desperation. Uh, they would essentially live in a world where, again, the bad guys won. They succeeded. Um, the arc of the universe didn't really bend towards justice. And if you're living in these conditions in 1910 or 1920, you don't know that MLK is in the distance. You don't know that Barack Obama is in the distance. All you know is what you experience in your life right then. Bad guys win is in the most eloquent way of putting this, so I'm gonna uh, borrow a quote from a judge. Uh, his name is Damon Keith, he's 94 years old. He sits in the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. He still writes opinions in the Sixth Circuit. I wish, I hope I can be 94 years old and still uh, have an able mind. But writing uh, on an opinion involving voting rights in Ohio, Judge Keith uh, said this. He said, with every gain in equality, there is often an equally robust and re reactive retrenchment. We must never forget that constant dialectical tension. For every action, there is a reaction. Which brings us back to our title, uh, Civil Rights Movement Today, A Second Redemption. I think right now we are living in an era and a time of great progress and great opportunity. But also, and this is critical, we're also living through a time of backlash, of retrenchment, of dissatisfaction, of anger. We have an African American president, a huge achievement for the country. We also have an ongoing crisis of police violence and misconduct. We have a Donald Trump and a political movement centered on a pledge to make America great again for certain Americans, not all of us. We are witnessing a resurgence of what I would describe as white nationalism and also a profound collapse in black America's sense of optimism and promise for the country. And these are things that over the last two years on the campaign trail in places like Ferguson and Baltimore, I've sort of seen both of them. I've seen huge rallies for Trump where people are unfolding Confederate flags and denouncing the president. I've talked to people who you know, I talked to a 16-year-old kid who told me that he had been stopped by police just five times that week already, just going about his life. Uh, these are the things that are uh, consuming our country right now and dividing our country. So with that said, with uh, my remaining time, I want to talk about a couple things. The first is that I want to talk about this backlash, uh, and I want to show it's show its roots. I'm going to show, show you where it came from, um, what it means, what, what it's reflecting. I want to also show how that backlash and how its origins uh, have been the crucible for a new kind of civil rights movement, a new movement for uh, racial equality. And I want to try to end on a hopeful note, but we'll see what happens. We'll see how that ends up when I get there. So first, the backlash. For all the justified complaints with President Obama and his policies, uh, there is one thing that we should always keep in mind about him as a political symbol. He's a radical political symbol. If the United States is a nation shaped by a rigid racial hierarchy going back to our very origins, then electing someone from the bottom of that hierarchy, an African-American man, um, 
that is a radical act. That's a radical event. Uh, and even more significant is the fact that we elected him with heavy support, unprecedented support from Asian American voters, from Hispanic voters, from African American voters. You look at the numbers and we had never seen anything like it. It was the first time uh, that a president had been elected with not even uh, or barely 40% of the votes of white Americans. Prior to that, you needed something like 45, 46, 47. Just 41%, I, I believe, of white Americans voted for Obama in 2008. And that was the landslide year. So that shows you how significant the votes of America's racial minorities were. So for a lot of liberal observers, um, this election, the composition of the voters that elected Barack Obama heralded a, a new and durable majority for liberal politics. Uh, one of my old editors who was writing at the Washington Post at the time uh, said that the future in American politics belongs to the party that can win a more racially diverse, a better educated, a more metropolitan electorate. It belongs to Barack Obama's Democrats. And that was true to an extent. But one thing that was also true is that there were millions of Americans, most of them white, who weren't attuned to this growing diversity and cosmopolitanism. I live in Washington, D.C. I grew up in Virginia Beach, Virginia. These are pretty diverse places. I, I'm used to all of this. But there are a lot of people who aren't, who one day the president was George W. Bush and the vice president was Richard Cheney and politics looked like they always had. And then the next day, in a blink of an eye, some guy named Barack Hussein Obama was president of the United States. It's disorienting. It's legitimately disorienting. And I have actually quite a bit of empathy for the reaction that would come. More than just the disorienting of Obama's election was the fact that it signaled a time when these people, uh, ordinary people, middle class people, their votes weren't in integral to winning uh, a presidency, that no longer would they have the Ronald Reagans and the George H. W. Bushes and the George W. Bushes. They'd have to, even, even, even if they wanted to elect someone in the future, they'd have to look for someone who may not necessarily look like them. Might be Marco Rubio, might be Ted Cruz, might be the senator from South Carolina, Tim Scott, who is African American, but not someone who looked familiar to them. So you have this momentous social change happening on one end, and then you have the Great Recession and the collapse in living standards and the housing crisis. Um, for a lot of white Americans who had been accustomed to a world where their whiteness delivered some kind of social status, that the people in power looked like them, the culture respected them, or at least deferred to them, uh, the combination of Obama's election, of the collapse of the economy, jeopardized this. Now, all of a sudden, uh, America doesn't seem like the kind of place that is necessarily for white Americans. So one way to describe this, uh, and I've talked to a lot of sociologists about this, is that white Americans felt a kind of status crouch, a status threat, rather. They fell into a defensive crouch. Uh, one sociologist writes of race and politics of the in the Obama era that the election of the country's first black president has had the ironic upshot of opening the door to old-fashioned racism to influence partisan preferences after it was long thought to be a spent force in American politics. Or, to kind of put that in less sociologist language, People were willing to ex express racist thoughts and racist beliefs about politics again after you know, 20, 10 years after we had thought that this had declined. And you can trace the emergence of this directly to the election of Barack Obama. And this manifests itself in several ways. Um, I think it's a bit unfair to describe the entire Tea Party movement as driven by racial animus, but there are parts of the Tea Party movement, parts of them that I reported on and experienced, that very much their principal complaint was that Barack Obama was bringing immigrants into the country, that Barack Obama was uh, spending their tax dollars to, to give to people who didn't deserve it. One way you saw this uh, defensive crouch emerged is in the, I think, remarkable reaction to the shooting of Trayvon Martin on one end and the killing of Michael Brown on the other end. 
where you didn't just have people defending the victims, but you had vocal movements of people defending the perpetrators. George Zimmerman, who did not seem like a good dude, even regardless of what you thought about the situation, didn't seem like the greatest guy in the world, had a whole universe of defenders. Same with the officer who killed Michael Brown. Before we knew anything about the situation, you had not just people defending Brown, but people defending Wilson in terms that were very racially charged. In St. Louis at the time, it was not that hard to find people using uh, not the best language to describe what was happening in Ferguson. In addition to these phenomena happening in, happening in our cultural life, you have also had this resurgence of a push against voting rights. So in North Carolina, in Ohio, in Texas, uh, in my home state of Virginia, there have been often brazen and breathtaking efforts to deny the franchise or make it extremely difficult for black voters, for Latino voters, for young voters to get to the polls, requiring strict requirements for identification, um, requirements that were extremely difficult to fulfill. And one of the other ways we've seen this reaction and this backlash, uh, this manifestation of status threat, is I think from the Donald Trump campaign. So, uh, I read a lot of coverage of Trump. I'm responsible for a lot of coverage of Trump. So if you have complaints about the media, feel free to throw them my way. Um, we talk about Trump in the media often as if he came into politics talking about trade deals. But Donald Trump got to start as a birther. His first, uh, his emergence on the political scene was as an advocate for the idea that Barack Obama was an illegitimate president, that he didn't belong. And when he announced his campaign last year, he could have took the ideas present in that birtherism and uh, spread them out for a presidential campaign. Uh, and all of this continues, right down to his appeals to black voters, which utilize gross stereotypes about black communities. Um, his main policy positions are built on ideas of racial exclusion, the Muslim ban, the wall in Mexico, the wall with Mexico. And there's a lot of strong evidence, emerging evidence from social scientists that suggests that Trump supporters, more than other Republicans, Trump supporters in particular, hold highly negative views about African Americans, about Hispanics, about Muslim Americans. You know, if Trump wins the White House, given the tenor of his campaign, the tenor of his support, we may well enter a period where uh, this kind of white racism, white tribalism, becomes a defining feature of our national politics. Which is to say that Trump, despite being a clown and buffoon, is also the embodiment of a very serious backlash in American politics right now. And it's a backlash that wants to reestablish old social dynamics and old hierarchies of power. Just a couple hours ago, I was reading the Washington Post, and they put out a new poll, and the new poll uh, noted that one of the ways you could predict support for Donald Trump was whether the respondent believes that whites and men have too little power in America. Respondents who say yes, probably Donald Trump supporters, um, more so than answering any other kind of question on the board. And this gets to what I was saying earlier about this idea of redemption, this period of redemption. A Trump victory would mean a kind of attempt to roll back some of the racial progress we have made over the past decade, um, where white racism and white resentment have a privileged place at the top of the summit of political power. So that's the backlash. It's not very good. It's depressing. Uh, with that said, at the same time that we've had this, we've also had uh, what, I, what I think, what I've perceived as a new flourishing of activism. One thing that's important to remember about the time preceding Obama's election, which we don't really think about as much anymore because Obama has been such a dominant figure on our politics, is that prior to Obama, uh, and beginning really with Hurricane Katrina, the black public, 
black public opinion was steadily negative, was going steadily more negative. The year before Katrina, uh, for example, about 68% of black Americans said that race relations were either somewhat good or very good. The year after, uh, that declined six percentage points to 62%. It declined to 55% uh, the next year after that. It began a steady decline going down from there. Uh, in another set of surveys, uh, when asked whether they were satisfied with society, um, African Americans, 41% say they were in 2004. Uh, this drops to 37% in 2006, to 30% in 2007. Just four months before the 2008 election, uh, more than three quarters of African Americans said that racism was extremely widespread. A year later, um, blacks were much rosier about, the, about the, the picture of the country, despite the fact that the economy had just collapsed. Uh, this is what the Pew Research Center had to say about these findings. Despite the bad economy, blacks' assessments about the state of progress in America have improved more dramatically during the past two years than at any time in the past quarter century. Uh, that owed itself a lot to the fact that the United States elected Barack Obama president of the United States. He was a sign that things were getting better despite what it looked like prior. But this wouldn't last. The Obama presidency since it began has been marked by a steady progression of racial controversies. First, they were kind of small, not terribly significant. You had the arrest of Henry Louis Gates at his home. Uh, you had the firing of a Department of Agriculture employee named Shirley Sherrod um, after being hounded and smeared by far -right, uh, a far-right website. Then they got more serious. You had the shooting of Trayvon Martin. In the shooting of J uh, Jordan Davis, you had the acquittal of George Zimmerman in 2013. And here's the key thing. With each of these incidents, and I should say back during the Bush presidency and even during the Clinton presidency, you had racial controversies, but you didn't have what would happen in the, under the Obama presidency, which was a, a younger generation of activists were uh, getting mobilized, they were getting primed for action, they were beginning to take charge of what was happening in the country. And this was churning along, and then it exploded with Ferguson. Uh, this small Missouri town, and I don't know if you've been to the St. Louis area, but one of the things about it is that it really is just a bunch of very small municipalities cut up into tiny chunks, and so Ferguson was almost nondescript. You wouldn't have noticed it had you driven through it. But it became the proving ground for a whole generation of civil rights activists, uh, including one of the most visible ones, uh, I think, right now in the country, uh, DeRay McKesson, uh, who tried to run for mayor of Baltimore, and that was a very interesting uh, race on his part. You had young black journalists, like uh, a colleague of mine, Wesley Lowry, who made their names and made their, really their careers covering what happened in Ferguson, covering the protests in the morning over the death of Michael Brown. But the fact that Ferguson was such a flashpoint also, I think, raises a question, which is what made Ferguson so different? Why was it that Ferguson was the thing that caught everyone's attention and not something else? And at the risk of being a little anticlimactic, uh, the answer was kind of just timing. Recall that right before Ferguson, we had seen on video the death of Eric Garner. We had seen the shooting of John Crawford in an Ohio Walmart who was carrying a pellet gun and he was gunned down in the aisles of the store. Uh, each of these incidents compounded the other. Uh, conversations about police violence after Garner's death became conversations about Crawford's death. And the entire discussion of Michael Brown was built on all of these. And again, we didn't just hear about these things, uh, read about them. We saw raw video. We, in a lot of ways, uh, in ways we hadn't really experienced since Rodney King in the early 1990s, had a visceral sense of what was happening. And all of this was broadcast on social media. So, Really, for the first time, uh, we are getting an avalanche of information about things that have been going on for a long time, going on, uh, going on constantly in many different communities. But now, we all saw them, and people could organize around them despite living in geographically very different places. 
with that as the backdrop, it really isn't a surprise that it was Ferguson and Michael Brown's death. And it's interesting to note that there was no video of Michael Brown's death. There's just eyewitness accounts, um, just people telling the press and each other what they saw happen. Um, there's no wonder that Ferguson already troubled with inequality, with segregation, um, with deeply unfair policing, that this was a town that would end up exploding. Brown's death was, in a lot of ways, the final spark in a summer of violence, uh, exacerbated by police misconduct, um, and sparking a reaction to what ended up being attempts to sort of minimize Brown's death as somehow being his fault. And so all of this inaugurates, basically, this new kind of conversation around racism, this new argument about racism. Um, this is where we see the Black Lives Matter hashtag pop up. This is where we see all this really begin to unfold. Now, I said earlier that the election of Obama, in a lot of ways, precipitated this. And I should explain what I mean by that. And what I mean is that for black Americans, and for young black Americans in particular, I think Obama raised expectations. It's one thing to experience profound racism and discrimination when there are no pretenses to equality. It's just the way it is. It's something very different when the dominant message is that we live in a post-racial society. Uh, even if what's happening is no worse than what happened before, it feels worse because your expectations are higher than they were before. And you see this in the history of the civil rights movement generally. The modern civil rights movement was jump-started after the Second World War, when returning GIs who had fought for their country, who had died for their country, who had seen their friends uh, blown up on foreign soil, came back and uh, the black ones had to come back to Jim Crow. And it was intolerable. How, how can I put my life on the line for this country and then come back and you treat me like this? Likewise, it's not a surprise that the black power movement doesn't pop up in the 1950s or the early 1960s. It pops up after the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. It pops up after major legislative achievements. Again, there's a pretense to equality. We've, we've won something, and winning that thing makes the remaining inequalities seem even more unfair, even more stark. Your expectations go up. This is just kind of how life works. Um, I kind of think of it as almost the, the inverse of the kind of uh, anger that has brought us Donald Trump. The difference, of course, right, is that Black Lives Matter and its associated movements and this push to uh, more fully realize uh, America's promises to its citizens uh, is one that's fundamentally positive. And in the two years since Ferguson, it's become increasingly more organized and influential. Uh, part of this, I, I hate to say, is because the, the tragedies keep happening. So that November after Ferguson, if you remember, in Cleveland, Ohio, Tamir Rice was killed, a 12-year-old. Uh, Rice's death was followed the following April with the killing of Walter Scott in North Charleston, South Carolina. He was shot while running away from an officer unarmed. A week after Scott was Freddie Gray in Baltimore. Uh, in Charleston last year, there was the massacre. Nine people killed while praying. So far this year, uh, the Washington Post, which has been doing great work cataloging police killings, uh, has found that 174 black Americans have been shot and killed by police, some of them armed, many of them unarmed. And we already know some of their names, unfortunately. We know Alton Sterling, we know Philando Castile, we know Terrence Crutcher, who died just last week. Each of these incidents has generated new coverage and new protests and new stories and critically new activism. And because of the steady drip of incidents, uh, we have never really ever stopped talking about Eric Garner and Michael Brown and Tamir Rice. We probably won't ever stop talking about Freddie Gray, Clementa Pinckney, Sandra Bland, and all of the others we have watched uh, on YouTube, on news channels, in our Twitter feeds. Their lives and their deaths are part of a new and wrenching and I think really unprecedented argument and discussion about race and racism in America today. And in that argument, Black Lives Matter is controversial. It's a flashpoint. Um, it's also vital. People working and, and uh, speaking under the mantle of Black Lives Matter have had audiences with the President of the United States. 
They have pressured this administration to take a criminal justice push further. Um, they made a mark on the Democratic presidential primary. There's even a moment when Republican presidential candidates like John Kasich and Jeb Bush were giving positive signals about Black Lives Matter. This past summer, um, a couple of Black Lives Matter affiliated activists and thinkers and researchers put out a very wide ranging platform to deal with criminal justice and economic inequality um, and immigration. Uh, and these are proposals that having read them and, and spoken to some of the people who written them, written them actually seem like they may find a place in mainstream politics in the next couple years. And that's, that's remarkable uh, progress in just two years. I think one of the most interesting things that come out of all of this is the fact that you're seeing, uh, for the first time, activists getting into races for district attorneys and for judges, attempts to shape the criminal justice uh, system, not just through regulation, but through replacing the elected officials who are often responsible for decisions on the local level. And, and bit by bit, those kind of victories, and they've happened in Florida and in Chicago, uh, can end up transforming um, how the criminal justice system works. What Black Lives Matter shows is the power of local, local organizing to achieve important victories um, and important gains. And that is something I think to be very optimistic about when it comes to trying to bridge divides and, and fix problems. So that's where I think we are as a country. Um, on one hand, we have a very real racial backlash against the progress, the racial progress uh, of Obama's election. And it's led by someone who might well become president of the United States. Uh, I think the odds are pretty good that he won't, but I'm not about to bet a lot of money on it. I'll say that. Uh, on the other hand, we have this sort of new civil rights movement, um, or at least something that is heavily indebted to the civil rights movement, uh, and one of the most vibrant political movements to emerge in recent memory. Uh, the future for both of these trends really does depend on the election. If Clinton wins, and again, I think there are good odds, but I'm risk averse, uh, she'll probably continue many of the policy of the Obama administration, which just doesn't mean the outward stuff you see. It means who she appoints or nominates for, for judicial positions. It means who's the attorney general. I mean, who leads the civil rights division of the Justice Department. Uh, and if she continues those things, and there's every indication that she will, then like Obama, she won't stand in the way of these new activist movements. She might even at times encourage them and work with them, which is a real victory. It's a little difficult to say what the world looks like if Donald Trump wins the White House, but I think it's safe to say that his victory would really empower some of the worst elements in American society. Um, there is a movement of white nationalists who have coalesced around Trump's presidency and see Trump as their vehicle to the mainstream, as a way they can bring their message of uh, racial division uh, and racial exclusion to the mainstream, to the masses. A Trump presidency, I think, would represent the kind of backlash that we just have not seen uh, since the time after Reconstruction. So those, to me, are the stakes. Those, to me, are what sits in the balance on November 8th or November 9th. Um, don't listen to me for when you should vote. I, don't, I will lead you astray. I don't know, it seems. Um, so with all of that said, I have uh, one more quote for you uh, after the first two at the beginning of this. And this quote's a little cliche, um, but I like it because I'm a Virginian. It's a summer Virginian. It's a very good quote. It's from William Faulkner. The past is never dead. It's not even past. We are living through history right now. Uh, we are living in history. Uh, old, dark forces in our history are trying to reassert themselves. Uh, they are hungry to be dominant again. And on the other end, uh, there are lights. There are points of light pushing back against those things. And so the question for us, uh, the question which I think drives American history is whether we succumb to those for forces, and again, we have before, there's no guarantee that we won't, or whether we work together uh, to beat them back and continue on our slow and not at, not at all inevitable path towards progress. Thank you.
I, I believe we're doing a Q&A, and so if you have a question, there are two mics uh, up front here. Uh, I would only ask that you say your name um, before you ask your question, and I also reserve the right to tell you to ask a question if you're going a little long, so just keep that in mind. So any questions? The mics are looking pretty lonely. if we could imagine or, or think about the forces that have been kind of reinvigorated by Trump's candidacy. I don't think they're going away right. um, if she wins. Um, can you kind of think about what the challenges will be? I mean, I, I guess I fear that, you know, there's a lot of energy into the election, I think, for those of us who hope that Trump does not win. Um, but I think that we have to also remember that that's one obstacle, right. and then we have a lot more work ahead of us. So could you talk a little bit about that work, hoping we have that work ahead of us? Sure, thank you Thanks. for your question. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't really think the things stirred up by Donald Trump are, are going away anytime soon. They, you know, you look at American history, they, they never have. When you, you conjure up these kind of forces, um, it takes a long time to kind of stuff them back in the box if you ever do. Um, so I think that if Trump loses in November, um, we will, as a country, have to deal uh, with, I think, a resurgence in explicit racism in our politics. And I think we'll have to deal with it for a while, in part because Trump will have demonstrated that you can be explicitly prejudiced and win a, win a major party nomination and you can almost become president. Um, and that will just be, that will be the work of a lot of little communities, of families, of families and of individuals, uh, people of goodwill, uh, doing what they can to shove that back in the box. Uh, if Clinton is president, um, will likely not have uh, you know, unified control of Congress, still probably Republican Congress or a Democratic Senate and a Republican House. Um, and so in that case, in, in that scenario, we'll probably have a lot of the same frustrations we've had for the past six years or so. Um, it'll be difficult to get legislation through. And I think, I think one thing that may happen is the energy in government begins to uh, fall from the federal government and, and to states and to localities and to big cities. And you're already sort of seeing this around the place. So the big movement to increase the minimum wage to $15 an hour had its genesis in cities and it has had most of its success in cities and it has driven the policy agenda for the Democratic Party because the Democrats are more likely to be in cities than they are otherwise. Um, and you know, innovative and entrepreneurial political leaders at that level maybe may start using their uh, influence and their you know, realm to try to do things that can't really be accomplished on the federal level. Good evening and thank you for being here. My question is, from understanding as a citizen that we do have laws in place for hate crimes. And do you deem it that it may be constitutionally activated in our country that when you have such individuals, such as Donald Trump, who is masquerading or more or less trying to play off and covertly uh, rebirth this surgeons again, if you call it the Redeemer in the lecture tonight, that him, Ku Klux Klan and all these other people who are politically hiding and wearing a mask and costume behind him, but puppeteering him in this political race for presidency, that the powers that be through our judicial system will come after them 
in the form of penalty because it is like truly right. in inducing and uh, making a resurgence of hate to be very blatant again, as, we, as you've already mentioned in the lecture and many of us know here tonight, is happening. So I guess the synopsis of my question is, is exact that, do you believe that our judicial system to offset that or to decimate it will then utilize what we have put into our uh, law, hate crime penalties or how that's treated you know, to go to prison or to be prosecuted, et cetera. Right. Do you think that might be a effective tool to uh, try to decimate what he's seemingly to do covertly? Yeah. Um, thank you for your question. Uh, unfortunately, you know, hate crime statutes are about, not about hate speech, right? So you can, you can still say whatever you want. Um, and as long as it's not explicitly inciting people, as long as you're not literally saying something like you should go kill those people, uh, there, there, there really can't be any penalties for it. So I don't think, I don't think any pushback for this is going to come back or it's going to come from um, law. I think it very much has to come from society, from civil society, and it has to come from, you know, from everyone. Uh, not just Democrats or, or liberals or whomever, but the, the many, many Republicans who did not support Donald Trump in the primary, who are disappointed with their party for nominating someone like Trump, they will have to push back against whatever he's drawn up and whatever he's encouraged. And they'll have to push back against any politician that's trying to take up that mantle um, if he loses. And if he wins, then I think they'll have to resist the temptation to just get along with it because he's, because he's on their side. I think. Um, this is one of those things, uh, the, the encouragement of prejudice that ought to transcend partisan lines. Doesn't always, but I think it should. Thank you very much for answering the question, and I digress. My name is Renee Michelle Amour. Um, if I may also ask the second part of that question, please, if I'm allowed. Sure. Is the reason why I ask that is no such thing as a stupid question or the idea of doing something that causes inclusion of all of us as people in our cultures, our background, to ratify and even possibly make a redemption of what has happened in history as you gave us a quick review on tonight with the reconstruction era, et cetera, and so forth. That certain things are seemingly to be concretely ingrained in our country that in later, like, in, like you said, you mentioned in the lecture that no one foresaw Barack Obama coming in, you know, in presidency from a certain era. But as a people, if we're to arrive to the highest occasion of our existence in the humankind, uh, there should be a cultural inclusion of what is applicable to all of us for safety, for the pursuit of happiness of things, and everything that's constitutionally founded here. It seems that these things are becoming blurred and I asked the second part of my question in this regards. Isn't it imperative that possibly we could take the hate crime issue that we have in play in our law to have the backing of the people to possibly bring that to a higher level of accountability for people who do that verbally to incite it and then rebirth it and then turn around and actively do it? And there seems to be not the same applied justice when it has occurred, when it's a person of color. Right. So do you think that it's possible that maybe, um, if it's being done secretly, quietly, or in your professionalism, have you even heard a whisper that this may happen to where it'll be more of a greater foundational standard to create a law that will be combative to right. that happening? Well, again, I just, I don't think that this is a question of law. Um, I think it's really a question of custom and a question of culture. Uh, and that just relies on people in their everyday lives pushing against. And there, there are things, you know, you know, when it comes to, say, police violence, there are things you can do through law to make sure those things don't happen again. But when it comes to kind of a, a political culture of uh, prejudice and such, that really is just up to us as citizens and not necessarily lawmakers. Thank you again for answering. I just concretely believe as a citizen it should be deemed as illegal, that you should feel safe wherever you go in this country and really in the world abroad. I understand. I understand. And I do thank, thank you. you for your time and answering. Thank you. 
Uh, hi, my name is Brayden. Hello. And I was wondering if you had a stance on the protests by Colin Kaepernick and him kneeling during the national anthem. Yeah. Thank you for your question. Um, I don't, it's funny, I don't know if I have a particular stance. Uh, I, I think that at the beginning of the summer, or during the summer, at the beginning of the past summer, Muhammad Ali died. And I watched a lot of people give uh, really poignant sort of eulogies to Muhammad Ali to kind of praise him as a man we should look up to, as someone who stood up for his beliefs. Kaepernick is right now kneeling for his beliefs, and the tenor of the conversation is very, very different. I'm sympathetic uh, to Kaepernick, and I would, I guess my stance on this is I would ask people who admire Ali but are bothered by Kaepernick to think about why. Um, think about what, what the difference is there uh, for them, if that answers your question. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, um, thank you so much for having me. Uh, it was a real pleasure. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for a great lecture, Mr. Jamal Bui. Um, and if you'd like to know more about our initiatives at the Woodrick Center, please go to our GRCC slash Woodrick Center. Otherwise, you also have information on your program for our next speaker. But that's all we have tonight. Thank you for coming.